Uh, well, we are starting a new series uh, called Covenant Relationships, and uh, we're doing it all together, and then we'll break into our regions and get more into the nitty-gritty. Um, if you know me, there's an occasional Nacho Libre reference. If you haven't watched that movie 50 times, you have not seen it enough. So um, it is a, a, a great series, and I, it's not just a need in Orlando. Uh, we didn't just come up with it here. Really, uh, we began to formulate this in Orange County as we saw really a need to uh, recommit and, to the relationships uh, that we all know and love in our church. Let me see how I'm doing here. And so the, the first part of this is really a recommitment to those relationships. A lot of this is very familiar, and you might uh, surmise very quickly as I begin this series, oh, he's actually just talking about discipling relationships, and he's rebranding it covenant relationships, and you'd be right. Uh, it is just, it's what we all know uh, of one another relationships, of fulfilling the New Testament commands, but in a practical way of of really committing and loving uh, one another the way the Bible describes. And then one of the keys to this series is about reconciliation and reconciling relationships. Because if you've all gone all in on a relationship in the past, if you've ever been to that place where you're all in, then you have been hurt in said relationship as well. And so I think as a movement and as a fellowship and as a church, we've sort of stepped back from our relationships. And it typically has not improved our spiritual situation much. Uh, and so we're going to lean now back into just this commitment to one another relationships. But as a part of that, there's also some reconciliation that has to take place. And then we're going to remind you, you know, we, we don't want it just to be all head knowledge and just commitment. Okay, you know, sign up. Uh, no, it's, we want to inspire you to see this is the reward. This is... When we do it, when we go all in, there's such a reward for that investment. And uh, so today we're going to talk about friendship in general. I have called you friends, to quote our Lord. And this whole series is based on the assumption that you agree that life is better with friends. If you don't agree with that, this might be a long four or five weeks for you. Uh, and if you don't agree with that, I relate to you, and I'll talk about the loners in the group here in just a moment. And I really am emphasizing the men in this series, and uh, the women I encourage to continue to come uh, for the next five weeks. We need you. Church is better with you. We need altos and sopranos, and uh, you help fill out the room and make our church a lot more attractive to outsiders. Um, so continue to come. But I'm talking to the men, and I, I say that, of course, tongue-in-cheek, because I know that the women here desire relationships as well. However, I do think this is the key to the church, is the men in this church being close to one another. We will go where the men in this church and their relationships lead us. So I'm going to talk to the guys, because we have a little more difficult time bonding Men typically don't just have play dates or what, I don't know what you call it, you know, we don't just sit across from Starbucks and, you know, hold each other's hands and cry it out, you know, we may need to do that, but the men need uh, some sort of a distraction. We need, we need an external source. Now, I've heard the admission standards at Florida are very high, so I don't know how all these guys got through, Bill, but... Uh, even the guy picking his nose in the back there, you know? <laughs> With men, there seems to be one of those kind of guys in all of your crowds, you know? I like the woman in the upper uh, corner there. Like, that's typically women observing men in their element. Uh, here's some more civilized uh, gentlemen uh, watching a more civilized sport. No, it's actually soccer is very uncivilized and chippy and uh, soccer is violent. Uh, so we had a great time last night watching Orlando City. Uh, here's some guys, some good looking dudes playing some football. Uh, I like it there, man. The unity, the uniforms, everybody looks good. We must have won that tournament because that's a good, good looking guys. No, all right. 
We got work to do then. You know, uh, fire and meat are two things that bring men together. If you notice, if you notice, guys can just stand and like this is how we bond. There's no need to really make eye contact because you have. I mean, this guy's kind of breaking the man code. It's like, whoa, you know, easy. There's meat right there. Let's just talk. Let's share our hearts. Let's just not look each other in the eye. Well, we're more confused now than ever about what friendship really is all about, right? I supposedly have thousands of friends on Facebook. Most really annoy me, actually. You know what I mean? Especially during election years. I'm like, these people are my friends? Yikes. Uh, this guy has over a thousand friends and followers. What's the problem? He's by himself. He's relationally inept without this sort of artificial sense of connection. And we in this age are in some ways more connected than ever, but we're more alone than ever before. And uh, I really think that most men end up as loners. And they don't start that way. You know, as childhood, we love friends. We bond with friends. We have friends at school. We have birthday parties. But as we age, we kind of just end up more and more and more alone. And so getting men to come back to God and come back to church is something that you know, uh, is kind of this worldwide effort. We got to get the men involved in God and in church. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we try to make church a little more man friendly, you know, stronger men's conference, iron men, iron sharpens iron, or just man church. Let's just get it over with. And let's just call it man church, you know. Most men, for the first time coming to church, they really don't want to go to man church. They want to go to, I'm looking for a godly woman church, but nevertheless, uh, that's okay. You know, that's what brought half the guys in here, and yet they found Jesus. Uh, and so, how do we get the men? You know, are we finding, are, are the men in this room finding the relationships that we really desire? Because I don't think we want to be alone. I just think we end up alone. And we desire relationships. And I think what drew us, many of us here, for the first time, we saw, we saw Jesus. We saw his ability not to take a group of women and change the world, though there were some amazing women that followed Christ. We saw Jesus' ability to change the heart of a man. And take those men and change the world. And I think for many of us, we came into this church with that sort of relationship because somebody reached out to us and gave us their heart. And we saw Jesus in this church and we saw Jesus in them. And so as I'm, we're calling you back to this level of relationship, we're calling us back to really Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus, near the end of his earthly ministry, told his followers... Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than that he lay down his life for his friends. And, and you are my friends, Jesus said, if you do what I command. I, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. And that's really what it was with Jesus. It was a progression of relationship. In John 13, he says, you call me Lord, you call me master and rabbi. And then he says, and rightly so, I, I am those things. But he says, but I'm now calling you friends. And so there's a progression in our relationships. And, and I'd like to ask us as a church, do we see that level of progression in, in our relationships? Or were we closer when it was more authoritative, right? Right? All right, here's your group, here's your discipling partner, here's your this, and you got to check in, and you've, there's some accountability. And, and then we kind of shed all of that at one point in time and said, well, we want it to grow organically. And I'd like to ask us, do we see a progression in the closeness of our level of relationships? Or do we see maybe a regression, maybe a step back? You know, for some, they may be stepping more into this, and they're probably more initiative and more mature, and yet I think there's a lot of us as men who are, our character is more of a loner. So we're going to talk about that. Jesus says, it's not servants anymore, 
It's about friendship. You know, but there are levels of friendship, are there not? Proverbs, in fact, says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And those two words both mean friendship in the Hebrew, but they are very different in their definition. Rea means an associate, a fellow companion, a neighbor, someone in your general company of people, right? And that can be a friend. And yet it says there's a warning. If that's all the level of friendship you have is just coworkers and companions and even folks at church, there's still a danger of our life coming to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, a cheb. It's a different word in the Hebrew. It's a beloved, a lover, a dearly loved, also a beloved friend. You could even use it as a lover uh, in the romantic sense, but it's also describing a different level of friendship. And I think as men, we need that, right? As women, we need it as well. We need a company. We need associates. We need part. I love big church. I love all of us coming together. I love singing together. Uh, but that can't be it, right? Like this is our Rhea, this is our associates, these are our company of people, and tomorrow on Monday, you may be in another company of people at your workplace. And you may not need 50 Ahebs, right? Uh, but you gotta have one. You gotta have at least maybe two, maybe even three. Maybe within this company, in this fellowship, there's a couple people who they, they really know you, and you know them, and there's a commitment. There is a covenant. And that's what Jesus was able to do. He had a a, a group of companions. He had a lot of followers. But then there were levels of even those relationships with the the twelve, with the three, and even John, uh, who says, I have called you friends, philos, beloved lover. John saw himself as the best friend of the Lord. You know, who would you want to be of anybody in the Bible, if you could be anybody? Can you imagine being John? The one human relationship on earth that got to be best friends with the Son of God. That's powerful, isn't it? And of all the levels of relationships we have here, we better have a best friend here that's sticking close to us. Amen? Amen. And so David and Jonathan is the uh, text by which we're going to, the lens we're going to look through this series. David and Jonathan and their relationship, it was a covenant relationship, a covenant meaning It's a legally binding contract in some ways. If you are in a homeowner's association, uh, you are in a legally binding contract. And depending on what you do with your trash cans, you might be in violation of that contract or whatever your lawn looks like or, you know what I mean, if you have a potted plant. I mean, those those are fighting words in some of those covenants, you know. And I don't know if you read it or not, but you still signed it. There's an agreement. Uh, Sometimes it just can be an agreement, an alliance, a commitment, bro. You and me, Saturday morning, 6 o'clock. We're going to make an agreement to be there, to pray with one another, to confess our sins. And and you know how that works, right? Friday night, you're like, oh, man, you're hoping. I hope they cancel, you know. (laughs) That's where we've been. I'm just saying this is where we're going, but this is where we've been. Let's be honest. Like a game of discipleship chicken, you know, who's going to cancel? And then you get together, and it's way too early, and it's Saturday, you're one day to sleep, and you spend some time together, you confess that you pray, and you never leave that session tired or disappointed that you didn't sleep. You leave feeling more refreshed than ever before. And so this covenant began just after David killed Goliath. Uh, and, and, and Jonathan was standing there watching and watching the hearts of Israel uh, get behind this David, this young, ruddy, and handsome guy. He was good looking. He had everything going for him, and now he just slayed Goliath. And, and in some ways, uh, you know, Samuel had already anointed David as the next king, whether that was public knowledge or not. Saul would still remain in power for 13 years. And, and yet, David was certainly next in line, according to Samuel the prophet, which puts natural enmity with him and Jonathan, who's the son of the king, which in a, you know, a patriarch or a monarch, Jonathan would be king. And yet, Jonathan admired David. He set that aside and really began a covenant with David. It says, after David finished talking with Saul, this is after David slew Goliath, uh, he became, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as he loved himself. 
From that day on, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant and a promise, an agreement with David because he loved him as himself. And Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and his sword and his bow and his belt. You know, all these things were royal. Uh, they, they meant he was in line to the king. His royal robe, right? His royal sword. I don't know if Jonathan got to go into battle much because as the son of the king, he would be very protected. I think that's why he and his armor bearer just snuck off that one time, you know? He was tired of being the coach's kid. I'm going to go kill somebody just to make sure I can do it. Um, Jonathan made a covenant with David. These guys were very different. You know, one of the things I see in our fellowship right now is we want people that are like us, relate to us, you know. Well, back in the day, he's just sort of assigned or random or whatever. We trusted God. And it's amazing how two totally different people used to be able to come together and form a best friendship. Chances are you married somebody that's totally different from you. There was a bait and switch. You thought they were your soulmate, that they were just like you. And then about a month in, you started detecting like, whoa, you're, you're very different than me. David was a shepherd. He was a musician. That's a lonely occupation, being a shepherd. You know what I mean? There's not a team of shepherds. There's not associate shepherd. There's like, it's like you, you know? So I think he just brought his guitar out there and played, you know? And wrote psalms. He was in love with God, but he was a loner. He, he wasn't very close to his brothers. They despised him. When, they, when Samuel came to anoint a king, it was like, is this all you have? And they're like, I think, no, oh, there's David, you know? He was not close to his father. It didn't even seem like he was that very close to his dad. And if he was, he was removed from his father's household by Saul. And David did not turn out to be a very great father, actually. Uh, and, and so uh, he had some issues with his dad, as many of us men and women all, all, all do. Uh, he inspired men, but even the men he inspired, like Uzziah, you know, he didn't treat them well with the same loyalty that they treated him. Uh, he killed one of them and slept with Bathsheba, his wife. And so David has some, some issues. Uh, and he was in his nature, I believe, a loner. And yet that was part of God's design for him. That's kind of just who God made David. And God said David still had a heart after him. And God, I'm sure, just saw David many, many times, alone with the sheep, singing songs, pouring out his heart. And so it is, in a sense... It's okay if many of us in our nature are loners. I am a loner. Uh, and, and there are times when, you know, I, in the ministry, uh, I'm thinking, all right, I've got a, a full schedule. I've got an appointment booked. And, and I'm one of those guys that when that appointment cancels, it, it's like birds start chirping. I think, man, I have, I have the next two hours, like... To spend with my favorite person, you know? <laughs> it's just me and music and my computer and my PowerPoint. I mean, I am a loner by nature. I fill up my schedule and I just get depressed, you know? <laughs> and yet I never regret at that time that spend that relationships. I need relationships desperately, but I don't go looking for them. I need Jonathan chasing me down. Yeah, let's do Let's get together. All right. When? Oh. You know, <laughs> Thursday, uh, 10, you know, I, I, I don't know why, but that's part of my nature. Jonathan was not like that. He was the son of a king. Uh, in fact, he was never alone. If you see in politics, you know, the Obama children, I don't know how much privacy they had in the last eight years or even today, you know, Secret Service showing up to their elementary school because you're never allowed to be alone as the son of the king, though they were always surrounded by people, soldiers, royalty, parties, and you name it. Jonathan grew up in the public eye. Now, he had issues with Saul as well. Uh, but he, he was a leader of men, and he was a warrior himself. Uh, and he admired David, and he was the initiator of the friendship. Does that make sense? Jonathan, you see, being the one over and over in this series, making this covenant with David. It happens four times that they reaffirm their covenant, and Jonathan being the initiator of those times. Are you a loner or an initiator? 
Just think to yourself, we won't take a poll or raising of hands because the loners won't raise their hands anyway, you know? <laughs> uh, this is at a men's retreat. I took a picture and, and, and only realized later on when I took the picture, this is in Orange County at a men's retreat. On the left side, there is not one man sitting next to another man. Now, this is part of the man code, and it is an acceptable practice. Like, when two men go to a movie theater together, guys, you know, right? You're not sitting next to each other. There's usually like one, maybe even two seats. You know, there's just sort of a man distance that we're comfortable with. But this is a men's retreat. Like, it's okay to have bromances at these, you know what I mean? And get close and, and confess sin and pray and hug it out, you know? But even in a men's retreat, the guys are just like, we're getting a little too close. Now, on the right side are all the campus and the teens, and they are hanging together. And I think that's indicative of how we start out with a sense of comfortability relationally. We start out with this idealistic view of relationships and closeness, and we see the benefit of being together. And as we age, we sort of shift over to this side and want to sort of get about three seats away from everybody and just... Isn't that true? And yet it's not good to be alone. This isn't even a scripture that's talking about marriage. It's just about mankind as an institution and womankind. Aloneness is not good. And our first covenant relationship for many of us, we understood it because we became a Christian and somebody reached out to us. And it was unlike anything we ever saw before because they initiated with us and they shared their whole life with us. And that's one of the things that Jesus says about friendship. I call you friends because everything I made known to you. Like Jesus didn't hold back everything about God, everything he disclosed to them. And I remember studying the Bible with Steve uh, and Jay Kelly and, and these guys just in my life, and I'm disclosing, and I'm t confessing sins, and I'm getting deeper with them in a matter of a couple weeks than I had been with my roommate in college at that time who I had known since I was three years old. And they were just a cheb. They were my company. They were my college buddies. And suddenly, a group of people who I began to get close to, because why? We made things known. We were vulnerable. We got deep. We went to the places that none of us want to go, but all of us want to go. And that level of friendship began at that time. And you know what's interesting, though? In the kingdom, in the church, that we all sort of look back at that relationship or that honeymoon phase or that first introduction to relationships and becoming a Christian with fondness but we don't realize how difficult it is to sustain that. And, and the reason why is when you look back, and when I look back, man, I realized Steve was doing all the heavy lifting. Steve was praying for me. He was bringing me coffee. He was hanging out with me. He was sharing his life. He was sharing the Bible. He was giving me rides to church. He was, and I'm like, wow, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. And when you go to that next relationship, you're like, man, it's not the same. You know what I mean? Like, where's the love? Where's the rides? Where's the coffee? Where's the... I'm giving the same amount. <laughs> the brother's not stepping up anymore, you know? Like, we're not close in this church. Really, we've just made less and less of a contribution to go all in with one another, I think. And so we begin to feel and say things that seem very legitimate to us, like, I just don't feel close to anybody anymore. Or we don't love each other the way we used to, right? Or maybe they, you know. It's great if you include yourself, you know, because that would be convicting, but sometimes it's a feeling that something's wrong out here. I'm going to find a new group. You ever have people like that that you're just always looking for the group of people that are going to love them like they deserve to be loved, and believe in them like they deserve to be believed in, or I need to find someone that can relate to me, someone more like my life stage, my kids, my everything, it's just custom, they're built for me. Or maybe this is the culture, you know, maybe this is where we've gotten and now I'll look elsewhere for relationships. That's tough, right? 
We need these relationships. We know we can't survive spiritually long term without them. But we go through this desert phase, and I think Satan's outwitting us, saying, you know, you've taken a step back. You haven't given all in. We talked about Ruth and Naomi and set the stage for what it means to give, what it means to have an uneven relationship of giving and going all in. Chesed. That's really what we're calling ourselves back to. You know, it is no wonder that a dog is a man's best friend. This is, of course, my dog, Copper. This is about 10 pounds ago of Copper, you know. He's, fortunately, he's sort of looking like a middle-aged dog now, you know. This was Copper in his youth when we bonded and made a covenant with one another. Um, <laughs> but that's not a complimentary statement about dogs or men. It's just a statement that fits the current paradigm of what we want to give to a relationship. (laughs) Because I don't really have to do a whole lot to copper. Like even now, if I get home, there's a restoration of the relationship and it is immediate. You know, I can be gone for a week and we don't have to talk through anything. You know what I mean? There's no like, well, I feel like You know what I mean? Like, if you're going to be home late, could you call me? Because I feel like like I've been waiting here all day, you know, and I've been hungry, but, you know, usually you feed me. But you know what I mean? There's none of that. It's just forgiven. There's no conflict. There's nothing to resolve. This is such a great relationship. (laughs) Now, if it's a cat, that pie chart works in reverse, by the way. But uh, no, I'm not going to start that war. They give a little sliver, you know, every now and then. You know, a covenant relationship looks more like this. It's more where both of you are all in. Now, is it 50-50? Probably not. You know, maybe one of you is doing a little more of the initiating. Maybe one of you is just kind of pinning it down. You know, you need somebody like that. Let's just not live in the land of good intentions where purple lives. But orange is the guy that says, okay, where are we meeting and, and what time? And that's about all it takes. I feel like if we had that in this church, if we were more orange, right? I didn't mean it to come, like, Florida orange. If there was more orange here, I should have made the purple guy blue, but uh, I'd be leaving out Florida State and UCF. Uh, Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to keep us connected and do a little more of the initiating. Does that make sense? Hit the next slide. You know, Jonathan did that. And that's all it took for them to begin that relationship. David, would he have done it? Probably not. This is a relationship that happened because of Jonathan's initiation. Now, David benefited greatly from it, as we'll see in this series. In fact, David wept the most at their last meeting together. So this means a lot. Those of us who are loners in the church who are dying inside spiritually because we think we don't need relationships, we do. We're just wanting somebody in our life. But we've got to repent and own it and make the initiative, right? We've got to be more initiative in this church if we're going to see these relationships. And so Jonathan initiated and he lowered himself to David. And you know, that's really what Christ did for us, right? God left nothing that is not subject to Christ, but who initiated this relationship between you and the Lord? (laughs) Who did most of the heavy lifting? (laughs) It would be the Lord, right? Jesus was made a little lower, it says, than the angels. But he's now crowned with glory and honor, but he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So Jesus initiated and lowered himself to us or this relationship would not exist. So we need to own that, brothers and sisters. I know you're coming along for the ride, right? Most of this does apply to the women in the church, I I feel. Uh, But I love the men getting on board and initiating relationships. Um, We've got to lower, we've got to initiate with one another for that to happen. Luke 20 says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And thus, the covenant relationship that we have 
with Christ. It was written in his blood. He did not hold back. He didn't, you know, want to meet us 50-50. He was all in, right? In, to the point of shedding his blood. And so this next lesson that we're going to do, not now, uh, is, <laughs> that was the intro. You guys ready for it? <laughs> Uh, that actually was the intro, but also the whole lesson. <laughs> We're going to talk about recommitting to these relationships. And what does that look like in this church? What, what might that look like in terms of a structure and tactile, like real relationships? Uh, we're going to talk also about, again, as I said before, reconciling relationships. And then we're going to look also at the rewards of the relationship. And my hope is that when people walk into this church, number one, we will meet them. They won't ever have to come a second time to be met, to be reached out to, to say, hey, are you new here? Hey, where do you live? Oh, I know somebody who lives right in your neighborhood. Let's connect with them right away. Let's initiate even here in the fellowship, but initiating with relationships. Those who are moving here, people are moving to Orlando from our sister churches all the time. That's an opportunity to connect and plug in right away. Let's make that the calling card of this church. We may not be able to build the facilities and have the water slides and have all the programs and all the money that these other churches have. I want, when people walk in, is that they become known, that they become tied into a relationship and that we initiate and make a covenant relationship with them and a covenant relationship with one to another. Amen? Amen. 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 Love you guys.